In a time of genius. In a time of blood. A bastard child grows into a man. Servant of kings. Survivor in a land of assassins. He builds an extraordinary legend. In a place where life is cheap. Skilled in the mechanisms of war and the workings of power, he creates the timeless masterpiece, the brilliant invention, and survives another day. Veiled in secrecy, marked by genius, and driven by his own code of survival and success. A man for all seasons, and a mystery for the ages. Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. It stood as a symbol of Roman glory for more than 1,000 years. But after a brutal siege, it falls at last to the Muslim Turks. The Pope, Pius II, right after the fall of Constantinople, reminded everybody in letters he sent throughout Europe that this was a monumental event. The collapse of the mighty Byzantine Empire seems like the very end of civilization itself. But civilization is about to see a rebirth. With the old city, an old idea dies, and a new one escapes, finding refuge to the west in the city-states of Italy. To the Byzantines, God is the center and meaning of everything. But a revolutionary idea, humanism, allows for the study of man and new explorations into science. It is a philosophy with the power to change the world. In studying God, we can study the theology and the philosophy of God. But in studying man, we can study biology, uh, zoology, anthropology, technology, sciences of all different types. Humanism transferred man's focus to man. In the city-states of Italy, humanism ignites a new age. The Renaissance, heralding an explosion of new ideas, new inventions, and new discoveries. It is a time like no other. It's a nice time to be born as a, a really brilliant person. In a small rural town in Tuscany, a young boy discovers the world. Almost from the beginning, the mysteries of nature fascinate him. He grew up in the countryside outside of Florence, and he seems to have been able to find all kinds of animals and plants and insects. But young Leonardo has no real place in the world, no future. He is the bastard child of a respected notary and a poor farmer's daughter. He lives in his father's house while his mother is left to marry a man of her own class. His mother married sometime after Leonardo was born uh, a local guy who is known through what seems to be a nickname, Attacabriga, the fighter, the quarreler, the guy with the fists. They probably lived locally. It's not, a, it's not inconceivable that Leonardo would have had some access to her, but it's equally possible that Leonardo's family kept him away from these other people who are of a different social station. Young Leonardo enjoys a comfortable childhood with his father and stepmother. But because of his illegitimate status, his prospects look bleak. It's sort of like a second class family membership. Legal offspring, obviously, are going to inherit the family estate, as well as the, you know, follow the father into the family business. Uh, Leonardo is disqualified. In some measure from that. Leonardo! Si, madre! Torna a casa, immediatamente! 
Ma perché devi sempre far di tutto un gioco? Destined for life as a tradesman, he cannot even take his father's name. He is known as Leonardo from Vinci. His family will spend no money on his formal education. You can sort of imagine what it must be like to have been uh, considered illegitimate in an age when being illegitimate really meant something. There were you know, professions that were closed to you. Um, you were really, you were constrained greatly by that, uh, by something completely beyond your control. Faced with his illegitimacy, young Leonardo begins to develop a code to push beyond all expectations, past all obstacles. It will eventually propel him into the corridors of power and on to greatness. In his teens, Leonardo moves with his father to Florence, a city driven by perilous politics. In this thriving place of commerce and beauty, one family stands at the center. A family whose importance to Leonardo will grow as he matures. The Medici. The Medicis are in charge of Florence because they were the bankers early on and they gained control of Florence. And even though it was a republic and somebody should be voting for them, they controlled all the votes. The Medici, rich and very powerful, are the most important patrons of the arts in Florence. Yet in spite of their power, the Medici bankers can never rest easy. Assassination is common, as rival banking families compete for the city's wealth. If you look at some of these paintings just of the, of the Renaissance leaders, they, they, they're wearing what looks like studs on their clothing. No, they're wearing cloth-covered armor. Mi interessa è difficoltoso, come avevamo discusso. E allora onoratelo col vostro sigillo. They're scared to death that they're going to get knifed in the, in the streets. And the Medici's keep a poisoner on staff at all times. I mean, what's going on? In a society governed by fear, suspicion breeds a brutal form of justice. Any accusation, personal or political, can be lodged anonymously through the tambour. This dangerous box throws a dark shadow on Leonardo's future. Once a citizen lodges a charge, the authorities investigate. Even the innocent are shamed and the guilty severely punished. The sight of dead bodies, executed in public, is commonplace in a city like Florence, as it is throughout his life. Leonardo lives in a time and place where life is cheap, particularly for the lower classes. He knows he must break free of his bastard status and earn a respectable position in society. And that means membership in the guilds. Florence is a city that is officially governed by the guilds. It's been that way since the end of the 13th century. The government of Florence is drawn from the most powerful guilds. The guilds are professional trade unions, but most are close to a bastard like Leonardo. It seems quite clear that he didn't have any kind of formal schooling, um, which would have been the norm uh, if he had been um, a legitimate child of, of his father rather than the illegitimate son that he was. For Leonardo, it is difficult to gain entry to even a lower non-professional guild. His one hope rests in his talent and the help of his father's well-placed friend. Tu devi essere Leonardo. Ti stavo aspettando. Tuo padre pensa che hai del talento. In 1468, when Leonardo is 16, his father sends him to Andre de Verrocchio, a highly regarded Florentine artist.
This is how you do things in Florence. You get referrals from your relations, your neighbors, your extended network of clients and friends. This kind of personal referral is how you, but in a certain way, break the practice of training your own son in your own line of work. Verrocchio agrees to take Leonardo as an apprentice, to give him the experience he needs to one day gain admittance to a guild. Here, Leonardo first comes to understand the connection between art and power. The Medici, the ruling family of Florence, often commission paintings from Verrocchio. Verrocchio was certainly the person you would think of in Florence towards the end of the 15th century. You know, if you want a painting, you go to Verrocchio. As Leonardo becomes part of the workshop, he realizes he can push beyond his social limitations. His code emerges, stronger now. If circumstances hold you back, always find another way to achieve your goals. But beyond the doors of the studio, Florence is entering a dangerous time. Even as the Medici family patriarch, Piero de' Medici, lay dying, enemies plot to steal control of his family's fortune. Piero, ti senti un po' meglio? Solo la morte può recarmi conforto adesso. All the wealth and prestige of the Medici could quickly come undone as plots against their very lives are quietly prepared. As young Leonardo da Vinci arrives in Florence to establish a career, Florence finds itself at the brink of violence. The ruling family of Florence gathers at the deathbed of the patriarch, Piero de' Medici. Great danger awaits his son Lorenzo, only 20, as the rival banking family, the Pazis, plot against him. Questa è la mia ultima volontà per te, Lorenzo. Devi guidare questa casata e guidare Firenze. Nessun altro può farlo. Devi stare attento, molto attento. The Pazzi Medici problems were problems of business. We don't think the business might end up in murder. Uh, maybe not the business outside of, of the underworld or the Sopranos or something along those lines, but this is what was happening. If you were a leader, your life was in danger. The Pazzi family hungers for the Medici's power and wealth. They will do anything to seize it for themselves. <laughs> The young Leonardo is unaware of the political storms gathering around Florence. Though he will never meet them, the Medici will exert a profound influence on his young, ambitious life. In the studio, Leonardo works on, his code driving him to learn all he can, to excel beyond his teacher's expectations. His notebooks reflect the demands he makes on himself. The painter must develop all his skills because there is no self-respect in doing one thing well and another badly. The Verrocchio workshop is active in all kinds of media, uh, has command of technologies of, um, of different kinds, not just painting, but painting on ceramics, um, marble sculpture, sculpture in bronze, uh, other me metallurgical enterprises, um, like the casting of cannons, the casting of bells. He joins Verrocchio at a crucial time. The maestro grapples with an incredible technological challenge. One of the things Leonardo would have seen in Verrocchio's workshop is the design and then the completion of a globe placed on top of one of the most important buildings in Florence, Saranno due tonnellate di rame dorato e deve essere bilanciato alla perfezione. Ma come, maestro? The construction of the two-ton ball and the engineering required to hoist it to the top of the Duomo 
will rival the completion of Florence's grand cathedral dome itself. It will be made of copper, gilded with amalgam of mercury. You couldn't call the riggers and have them come do it for you. You had to do it all yourself from memory with the skills you had learned. Uh, so he picked up an enormous amount of not only artistic training, but practical engineering training uh, and mechanical training, just being part of the studio. Leonardo studies the Cara Granda, or Great Hoist, which will lift heavy objects to the peak of the dome and the swiveling crane at the top. This early exposure to mechanical engineering will have great influence on his later inventions. In Verrocchio's studio, Leonardo sees how his talent might allow him to escape the limitations of his bastard origins, and he is about to have his first taste of the world he aspires to. Verrocchio and his students are invited to bring their best work to the Medici Palace to prepare for a visit from the influential Duke of Milan. According to 16th century Italian biographer Giorgio Vasari, Leonardo has already distinguished himself. The greatest of all Verrocchio's pupils was Leonardo da Vinci, who, beside beauty and grace, had a power of intellect that whatever he turned his mind to made himself master of. Leonardo, portalo a man! In the grand house, the young men will see how wealth and beauty come together in the homes of the very powerful. An inspiring lesson for all of them. But the arrival of the Duke of Milan provides an even greater inspiration for Leonardo. As the Duke, the patriarch of his force of family, parades into Florence, Leonardo watches from the cheering crowds, like Leonardo. The Duke is an outsider with no pedigree, and yet he is at the pinnacle of power. The Schwartzes in Milan, they are actually the descendants of uh, condottieri, of mercenaries, who at a certain moment in time moved from being hired soldiers into actually marrying into the political uh, lineages and then actually coming into control of Milan. Leonardo cannot help but be inspired. In the Duke, he sees a man who has overcome his common origins, achieving influence and success. To do the same, Leonardo knows he must use every advantage he has. He was supposed to be extraordinarily handsome, very concerned about his looks, always dressed very well, supposed to be enormously strong. They said he could bend horseshoes with his bare hands. People just immediately liked him when they met him because he had this kind of um, undefinable quality to him that, that made people be attracted to him. And that's also a quality that is described in Leonardo's art. Though it is too early for Leonardo to know it, his fate and his future will hinge on the Sforza family as he uses his charisma and his talent to build a better life. Leonardo is now 20. He completes his apprenticeship and has finally joined the guild as a painter. A huge step into the world of professional legitimacy. He can now seek high-level commissions on his own. But something holds him back. Da Vinci stays in Verrocchio's studio. Perhaps it is loyalty. Perhaps he is still unsure of his abilities. But he stays. The advantage there is he doesn't have to go out and set up by himself. There's every indication that Leonardo is temperamentally unsuited to opening his own shop. Usa un tocco leggerissimo qui Leonardo, leggerissimo. We can see a large number of commissions for paintings being at least in part turned over to the young Leonardo so that he's a serviceable, adaptable, younger partner in the firm. And as he works, Leonardo's reputation grows, even reaching the attention of the Medici family. In the case of the Medici and, and Leonardo, it appears, though, that they recognize very early on 
that this guy had great talent and he was going to exceed his mentor and exceed his fellow students and so they took a particular interest in him. Here in the workshop as Verrocchio's protege, Leonardo's first great work emerges. It is considered the oldest surviving Leonardo painting. The angel on the left, far in the corner of Verrocchio's The Baptism of Christ, is only a fragment, a tantalizing glimpse of the genius to come. It is only the mediocre pupil who does not surpass his master, Leonardo writes. And legend has it that Verrocchio, after seeing Leonardo's angel, never painted again. These are all qualities that you can look at that painting today and you can see that's the hand of, of somebody else, some exceptional painter who really is not present in the rest of this painting. Leonardo had an incredible ability to see motion and to capture motion in his paintings. For example, the ringlets of hair, which have a kind of balance or spring. He was able to suggest that with paint uh, in a way that no one else really could. Talented, connected, attractive, Leonardo knows what he wants and is on his way to securing it. But the jealousies and envy of others, anonymous voices and accusations will put at risk all that he has built and threaten to send him back to oblivion. In a little more than a decade, Leonardo da Vinci, at age 24, transforms himself from the bastard son of a notary to a legitimate artist recognized by the Medicis, the most powerful family in Florence. Florentines are very competitive. It's very, very frustrating to be an artist in Florence, but also competition makes things better, makes, makes you do a better job as an artist. In Verrocchio's studio, his persistent experimentation with paint and technique sets him apart. This commitment becomes a vital part of his code, a way to push ahead of his competitors who are better educated. He records his thoughts in his notebooks. I know that I am not a man of letters. Experience is my one true mistress, and I will cite her in all cases. Only through experimentation can we truly know anything. Leonardo sets up this opposition between authority, which is transmitted through books, and people like himself, these maverick figures who operate outside normal professional boundaries, who investigate, who take things apart, see what they're made of, to see how they work. A man of unusual sensitivity, Leonardo cherishes nature and will not eat meat, refusing to be a tomb for other creatures. To him, nature is the ultimate machine, and he holds its mysteries in respect and awe. He spends his life trying to discover how it works, the movement of clouds and water, the mystery of birds in flight. Science, nature, mechanics, Leonardo pictures them as one entity to be captured through his creative life. Nature is one thing, human nature is something else. The success that has lifted him above his bastard status has also earned him envy and resentment. Dark forces move against him. Oblivious to any danger, Leonardo throws himself into new experiments to understand the nature of light and shadow. He examines the fall of candlelight on fabric and how the human eye records it. His notes reveal the importance he places on these studies. Nothing can be recognized without light and shade. It is only through the eye, the window of the soul, that we can truly understand the complex workings of nature. He would have these casts made of draped fabric uh, and move the lights around, you know, set the candles in one position, look at the shadows, sketch it out, move nothing else but the light 
to somewhere else and then sketch the exact same piece of fabric again that you know, hasn't moved. The only thing that has changed is the interplay of light and shadow on it. But in 1476, envy and betrayal catch up with him. Born in the hands of the Night Watch, the dreaded secret police of Florence. Messer Leonardo da Vinci. Siamo delle guardie notturne. Siete accusato di crimini contro Dio. Dovete venire con noi. At 24 years old, Leonardo is anonymously accused of sodomy with a 17-year-old male prostitute. For repeat offenders, there could be um, prison terms and, and execution. Um, the official penalty for, uh, uh, for, for sodomy was burning, and was being to be burned to death. The humiliation is brutal. Nothing, he writes, is to be feared so much as a damaged reputation. The fact is, it does affect him. He was a proud individual. He's a proud young man. He knows he's going someplace. And a charge like this could really have set back his career. But at the trial, no evidence is brought against him. No witness is presented. The charges are dropped. The cruel act of an anonymous enemy. But dark days are just beginning in Florence. Political storm clouds gather as deadly forces move against the Medici. Florence is nearly surrounded by the territories of the Pope, which extends south to the city-state of Naples and north to Ferrara. But this realm is not enough for the avaricious Pope Sixtus IV. The Pope conspires to expand his power into northern Italy, into the lands held by the Medici. To break the Medici stronghold, Sixtus finds an eager ally in rival banker Francesco de Pazzi. Ed io, Francesco de Pazzi, presterò a voi i soldi necessari ad estendere le terre papali. The Pope transfers his accounts into the coffers of the Pazzi family bank. But the Pazzi want more than the Papal account. They want the Medici out of the way. Forever. The Medicis needed money in their banking system. The Pazzi's needed money in their banking system. And when the two of them were vying for what little amount of money there was in Italy that was not already spoken for, that's when problems occurred, and that's when we get to violence. It is Easter. In celebration of the Prince of Peace, the Medici take their personal seats across the aisle from the Pope's henchman, Francesco de Pazzi. They have no idea of the danger they're in. At a prearranged point in the mass, it begins. Giuliano de' Medici gets stabbed savagely 19 times and bleeds to death on the cathedral floor. His wounded brother, Lorenzo, barely escapes. With the Pope behind them, the Pazzi family believe they will get away with their plot. They are dead wrong. The Medici supporters quickly rally, and the Patsy uprising is put down with extraordinary violence. Lorenzo's counter-strike is swift and merciless. We get a sense of the Medici's power in the outcome of the murder, the immediate retribution. There was no rights for the criminals. 
they were dispensed with, and they were dispensed with in a very public manner. That very day, Francesco de Pazzi is hanged alongside a co-conspirator, the Archbishop of Pisa. They drag his body around, they chop it to pieces, humiliate it in all kinds of ways. This is familiar in ways that we find hard to imagine. But the Medici have not finished. One assassin is still at large. Weeks later, Bernardo Baroncelli, the murderer of Lorenzo's brother, is finally captured and hanged before an enthusiastic crowd. Leonardo da Vinci is there. Here's the young Leonardo drawing this hanging corpse and writing underneath who it is and, and exactly what he's wearing. That's one of the first things we have of Leonardo. Leonardo makes the famous drawing of Baroncelli hanging on the gibbet. The bodies of condemned criminals is commonplace in a city like Florence, as it is throughout Italy. Violence and murder taint the very air of Renaissance Italy, and it will continually color Leonardo's work. Two messengers race to Florence, carrying deadly news. The Pope has excommunicated Lorenzo de' Medici in retribution for executing the Archbishop of Pisa. He dispatches the army of Naples to force Lorenzo to surrender. This is a big army. This is something that is going to be difficult to defeat. And difficult to defeat without a huge amount of economic loss and loss of lives and societal upheaval. The Republic of Florence faces annihilation. Here, in all its terrible glory, is the greatest of the Renaissance arts, the art of war. Without a miracle, the city that has given Leonardo da Vinci his only real future will be destroyed without a trace. Mr. Leonardo da Vinci. Arrested on trumped-up sodomy charges, Leonardo da Vinci endures a damaged reputation. And then Florence itself is thrown into danger as war erupts with Naples. To punish the Medici for the execution of one of his archbishops, Pope Sixtus sends King Ferdinand of Naples to invade Florence and attack the smaller Florentine army. The Florentine forces, mostly mercenaries, fight with the sustained violence of professional killers. But the more powerful army of Naples quickly take the upper hand, smashing into the Florentine forces with unforgiving savagery. In the terrible aftermath, it is clear to Lorenzo that the city's plight is desperate. His troops are being cut to pieces. He must find a way to end this war and somehow save Florence. It seems the larger political landscape may provide Lorenzo with a way out. The Muslim Ottoman Empire, greatly feared by the Christian Europeans, has threatened the entire peninsula for some time. Florence, Naples, and the Papal States are all at risk. In a bold and dangerous move, Lorenzo travels to confront King Ferdinand of Naples, face to face, attempting to convince him that the Italian states should be unified against the Turks rather than fighting each other. If he fails in his mission, Florence is finished. Se una bombarda colpisce a segno in linea diritta a dieci braccia. The risk was significant. He could have died. He could have been taken hostage while he was gone. He could have been replaced by usurpers. Intrigued but unconvinced, the king has him arrested while he considers the proposal. 
back in Florence, Da Vinci, like everyone else, is caught up in the tension and anxiety of impending war. He begins designing ladders and other devices for defending and scaling walls. These ladders are designed to carry two men. They are also useful for a tower, where you might fear that a rope ladder could be detached by the enemy. It's all engineering, 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 because that's sort of the reality of Italy at the time that Leonardo's alive. You have all these different warring city-states, uh, and warfare is a you know, constant fact of life. Da Vinci labors on and waits, putting his active mind to work on defensive fortification and other weapons of war. Three months pass with no word of Lorenzo de' Medici. In the streets of Florence, the citizens wait in fear. The weeks drag on without news of their leader or their larger fate. The people go about their business as hope dwindles. The Medici dynasty and Florentine independence seem doomed. They knew what their situation was. When Lorenzo's in the camp of an opponent, they must have been nervous. He could lose his wealth. He could lose the city. The Florentines could lose the city. And then, a commotion rolls through the streets. In triumph, Lorenzo returns, having convinced King Ferdinand of Naples to end the war. The crowd celebrates his courage and statesmanship. Lorenzo the Magnificent has pulled Florence back from the brink. As peace at last comes to Florence, Leonardo receives a commission to paint the Adoration of the Magi, an altarpiece for the monastery at San Donato a Scopito. It is his first important work. We have the Adoration of the Magi treated like nobody has really conceived this event before. Among the turmoil of figures that are surrounding the kind of serene virgin and child, this frenzy of devotional attention, there are rearing horses. It's a turmoil of men and horses. He forms the composition almost in a square with a triangle made up of the virgin and kneeling kings. But here, Leonardo is using the body of the horse to invest his composition with dynamic motion and energy, the sense of frenzy, the sense that this is almost like an apocalyptic event in the Incarnation. Tantalizingly, some scholars think the standing figure of the young man on the bottom right may be a self-portrait of the young Leonardo. The work is considered an overture, a first statement of Leonardo's great work to come. But it doesn't go well. After devoting extraordinary time to the underpainting, he leaves it unfinished. His notebooks suggest his reason. To conceive an idea is noble. To execute the work is servile. Somebody who's intensely curious, uh, restless, doesn't like to stay at one thing. The point at which something's ready to be finished is the point at which it's no longer interesting. He was much more interested in the natural world, in the mechanical world, and only painted uh, occasional paintings when he seems to have had a cash flow problem. It is a bad time for da Vinci to abandon his painting. Lorenzo de' Medici is considering artists for a plum assignment a trip to Rome to help decorate the Pope's Sistine Chapel. It is the kind of commission that a young artist like Leonardo could only dream of, a real chance to shine before the most powerful patrons in Italy. 
Lorenzo's choice will affect Leonardo's future and shape his destiny, for better or for worse. Even as word of Leonardo da Vinci's talent spreads, he appears to lose interest in his career. An important commission is not completed, clients grow angry, and when Lorenzo the Magnificent chooses his finest artists to send to Rome, da Vinci is not selected. The Adoration of the Magi is one of the great masterpieces of the High Renaissance, and yet Leonardo was unable to finish it, and some believe that he had conceptualized the end of the painting in his mind, and that was enough for him, rather than actually going to the brush and doing it physically. And so he found himself in lawsuits a number of times because he couldn't finish his work. He cannot deal with the ordinary conditions of production, of clientage, uh, of contract, supplying works to deadline uh, according to a patron's specifications. He didn't finish anything. Psychologists today have names for these things. Perhaps he was ADD. Perhaps he was obsessive compulsive. Maybe he was anxious. Maybe he was depressed. We don't know exactly what his ailment was, but there seemed to be something afflicting his mind. It seems that Da Vinci's greatest gifts, his restless imagination, an endless stream of ideas, complicate his drive for success. Again, circumstances hold him back, and he must find another way to achieve his goals. You're not really sure he wanted to be an artist. That was his inroads into the court life and into the patronage life. Uh, but when he gets there, he almost kind of leaves it behind. Unsatisfied with painting, Da Vinci decides it is time for a change. His code demands that he find another channel for his ambition. He needs a fresh start and new opportunities. And so he travels to Milan. As the most northern of the Italian states, Milan is the most vulnerable to foreign invaders. And so it is heavily militarized, a center for weapons production and military technology. As he moves to the armorer's stalls in the streets of Milan, Da Vinci finds a vibrant city always on the brink of battle, always ready to defend itself not just from rival city-states, but from the superpower of France as well. In the tools of war, large and small, Da Vinci sees a future he could not realize in Florence. Italy is a theater of war as local powers call in the bigger powers of Europe with disastrous results. In the royal palace of Milan, a letter arrives. Carefully worded and boastful in tone, it presents to the acting Duke Ludovico Sforza the credentials of Leonardo da Vinci, not as an artist, but as a genius of military engineering. I have plans for extremely light and strong bridges, adapted to be most easily carried. I have plans for making mortars, easy to transport, and able to fling small stones, almost resembling a storm and creating smoke terrifying to the enemy. Where a bombardment of cannon might fail, I can make catapults and other machines of marvelous accuracy and not in common use. Da Vinci's designs are visionary. His covered assault car is an improvement of an earlier well-known idea, but it will take 400 years before the concept is realized as the modern tank in World War I. Da Vinci describes the machine in his notes. I will make covered chariots, which will be impervious to any body of men at arms who try to shatter it when attacking the enemy with artillery. The real innovation is its mobility. Hand cranked by men or horsepower, the cranks attach to horizontal wheels geared to the four driving wheels. Close examination shows that Da Vinci's design, as drawn, would have the drive wheels turning in opposite directions, 
an error, or a means to confuse an enemy that might steal his designs. We have a repertory of drawings uh, made by Leonardo showing savage-looking uh, instruments of warfare, chariots with sides that you know, slash through the flesh of an enemy army. It is an improvement on the old Roman-style chariot by adding an upright lantern gear with four huge scythe blades mounted above, like a curved blade helicopter. Da Vinci's design for a cannon shows hundreds of swarming bodies dwarfed by the colossal bronze gun and reveals one of Leonardo's obsessions. He loved scale. Um, he loved to speculate and, and dream about things on a scale just vastly beyond that of the period. So he has these gigantic speculative designs for incredible killing machines. Da Vinci's fantastical weapon designs are typical of his continual pushing beyond the ordinary, always dreaming in the extreme. In his life, it will be a pattern, a part of his code. Never be limited by what has been done before or what others might think. He certainly sells himself as somebody who has secrets, somebody who knows the technology of military engineering, making guns, making weapons. Da Vinci hopes that Ludovico Sforza, the acting Duke of Milan, will commission him to build these war machines. Ludovico Sforza is the brother of the assassinated Duke of Milan. He's acting as the regent, basically the effective ruler of Milan. And he's basically controlling the defense policy, the foreign policy of the Milanese state. Ludovico will hold power only until his timid nephew, Jan Galeazzo, comes of age, if he ever does. I think everybody expects that the one thing that Ludovico really wants is the Dukedom of Milan. Uh, he's prepared to go to extraordinary lengths to get it. But the armies of kings and the cruel uncertainty of politics will overturn Ludovico's dreams of glory and everything that Da Vinci has hoped for. After leaving Florence, Leonardo da Vinci, now 30, arrives in Milan hoping to sell his skills in military engineering to the acting Duke Ludovico Sforza, a shrewd and militaristic noble. He walked away from what would have no doubt been a secure and comfortable living as the society painter in late 15th century Florence. He went instead to the bustling but military, aggressive, politically turbulent city of Milan, up near the French border. At the end of the 15th century, Italy is a theater for war, as the smaller city-states of Milan and Naples struggle to survive against the superpowers of France and the Ottoman Empire, pressing in from all sides. Cleverly exploiting these unstable politics, Leonardo's letter to the Duke outlines every imaginable military skill he has as an engineer. Fortress design, cannon construction, siege machines. Only in the very last line does he mention that he is also a painter. Unfortunately, Da Vinci must set aside his excitement about military designs. The Duke needs a portrait of his mistress. Despite Leonardo's disappointment, the painting becomes one of his most famous and important. The Lady with an Ermine. It is revolutionary. The first time a portrait shows the sitter's thoughts or feelings through posture and gestures. This relates to a series of interests being pursued by Leonardo about the motions of the mind. You know, as the mind moves, so the body expresses the motions of the mind. Or as Leonardo would say, that's where the movements of the soul 
make themselves most manifest. Her head turns to the right, as if distracted by something to the side. The animal as well is tense and alert. Again, Da Vinci's code pushes him to tackle new ideas. He's almost obsessive in his quest to want to know as much as possible about what he's interested in while he's interested in it. Sforza, the grandson of a mercenary, and Da Vinci, the bastard son of a notary, depend on each other to increase their social standing. Guardate da questa parte adesso, signorina Gallerani. È un piacere posare per voi. This is not what he came to Milan for, but he is experienced enough to know that power and opportunity are always close companions. And the enormous Sforza family ego soon presents that opportunity. The Duke commissions a colossal statue of his father, astride a powerful stallion. And so Leonardo begins to study the proportions of horses, using a small and docile model as his subject. The distance between one ear and the other should equal the length of one of the ears. The length of the ear should equal a fourth of the face. Sforza wants a statue larger than any other, the biggest horse monument ever seen. It's often held that these warlord princes used art as a means of making themselves look more permanent, more legitimate, more established than perhaps they were in practice. The Sforza have only been around from 1450, but their equestrian monument is going to outdo all others that exist. Leonardo considers the challenge of creating the 24-foot-high statue a career-making opportunity, a triumph of art and technology to last the ages. He will devote more than a dozen years of his life to the process. It was going to be a statue on a scale so much larger than anything that had come before it that it required all kinds of new technologies to figure out how to make this thing. Extending his vision and skill to the utmost, Leonardo will create countless smaller clay models and devote the next several years to figuring out how to cast the Colossus in 60 tons of bronze. Because he wanted to cast the horse in particular as one piece, this would have been cast upside down, he had to dig casting pits. Well, Milan is built in a river valley and there is a water table down there. The head of the horse pointing downward would have been just about at the level of the water table. And if you in fact start heating up uh, the water table in an area, you will create some very serious problems, possibly even an explosion. So in other words, he was working very close to the limits of the possible. This is the very essence of Leonardo's code, to push beyond the expected, not only in his work, but in his life. And as the great horse slowly takes form, Leonardo turns his lively mind again to weapons of war. Like the horse, his designs are huge, monumental. He always engineers these things that are just enormous, much, much larger than anything that existed at the time. And uh, the giant crossbow is sort of the, the poster child of this, this mentality. Uh, it's about the size, probably, of a tractor trailer uh, in length. The construction is highly advanced, with the bow to be built of laminated sections for the greatest strength and flexibility. The bowstring, drawn back by a worm gear, can be fired silently. People look at Leonardo's drawings of things like the giant crossbow, and they seem to think that this is an original idea. It isn't. What Leonardo is doing is taking an idea that's fairly commonplace and seeing how far he can push it. He begins his famous notebooks, an obsession that lasts his entire lifetime and confounds us to this day. It's estimated he will fill over 15,000 pages before he dies. What did he write in his notebooks? Everything. Laundry lists. Don't forget to get the money that so-and-so owes you. I need this at the store, moving lists, uh, sketches of people that he saw on the street who had interesting faces, notes to himself of 
you know, anything he wanted to remember. Leonardo often composes these notes from right to left, even forming the letters and words backwards, as if in a mirror. People would you know, speculate, and still speculate, you know, that he was trying to write new code. He didn't want people copying his ideas. Maybe he was saying things that he didn't want people to be able to read. But the most likely reason is simply that he learned to write as a left-handed child, and so composing left to right, even writing backwards, came naturally to him. By this time, da Vinci has taken an assistant. His name is Giacomo, a young boy from the lower classes, destined to limited prospects. He helps Leonardo build the many mechanical contraptions and novelties for Ludovico Sforza's elaborate parties. Giacomo, perché devi sempre giocare con tutto? E dammi quel pianeta. Da Vinci comes to call him Salai, meaning little devil. The mischievous boy will stay with Leonardo for the rest of the artist's life. <laughs> and Salai's name will appear in Leonardo's notebooks more than any other. Salai will be with him on one of the most important days in Da Vinci's life. Ludovico stages an elaborate family celebration, which features Leonardo's colossal clay model of the Sforza horse, unveiling it for the first time before the nobility. The Sforza horse was supposed to be uh, the largest cast statue in the world that was going to uh, you know, sort of trumpet the glories of the house of Sforza and also probably secure Leonardo a lifetime uh, position in the court there. The party, like Da Vinci's horse, is a celebration of Ludovico's power. The attendees include Ludovico's beautiful wife, Beatrice d'Est, and his nephew, the real Duke, Jan Galeazzo, now 25. It's become quite apparent that young Galeazzo Sforza has been sidelined by Ludovico, his uncle, who really has designs on the duchy for himself. Jan Galeazzo will never assume power. Within the year, he is dead. Some say poisoned, making Ludovico the duke at last. With nothing to curb his ambition, he will set Milan and Leonardo on a collision course with war. Siamo pronti, Leonardo. In the end, it is all about status, influence, the magnificent Da Vinci horse, and Ludovico's dangerous ambition. In 1494, as the new Duke of Milan, Sforza joins forces with France. Together, the powerful allies invade the Italian city-state of Naples. The risky move puts Milan and Leonardo's plans for the great horse in jeopardy. It came down to the necessities of the day, uh, being that there was very little metal, and uh, the Duke of Milan had the choice of casting cannon or giving this metal to Leonardo to make a statue. He chose to, you know, do the expedient thing and actually look to his own defense. With war on the horizon, the 60 tons of bronze set aside for Da Vinci's great horse is melted in the furnaces of Milan and poured into cannon molds. Leonardo remains stoic. As His Excellency's mind is occupied elsewhere, the arts are put to silence. Of the horse I will say nothing, because I know the times. The Duke, still eager to establish a great legacy for this Forza name, gives Da Vinci a new commission, a religious mural for the court church Santa Maria della Grazia, to be decorated with his family coat of arms. 
it will become one of the world's great masterpieces. But to the priest's consternation, years pass with no sign of completion. Maestro Leonardo, quando pensate sarà finito? Ho solo bisogno di mettere una faccia a Giuda. No, fermo lì. La vostra sembianza sarà perfetta. <laughs> Leonardo spends more than three difficult years on the mural. A complex and beautiful rendering of Christ's final meal with the apostles. It is called the Last Supper. Revolutionary for its time, Leonardo's painting captures the dramatic moment when Jesus tells his apostles, one of you will betray me. In his writings, Leonardo describes how the gestures and faces of the apostles convey such intense distress. One twists the fingers of his hands together and turns a grim face to his master. Another, with hands outspread, showing the palms, shrugs his shoulders. Da Vinci's attention to human response reveals his obsession with science. He mastered anatomy, he was a master of geometry, he mastered perspective, and by utilizing all these sciences, Leonardo could uh, create an art that was scientific in a way. Painting was a source of knowledge, just as geometry was a source of knowledge. But in The Last Supper, Leonardo pushes his scientific approach too far as he experiments with his paints, incorporating oil, which proves incompatible with the plastic base. So he decides he's going to try a new technique at uh, drying the, the fresco, and it doesn't work. In fact, it destroys much of, the, of what he has labored to do. Within decades, dampness in the wall begins to disintegrate the oil-based paint. But Leonardo will not be there to see it happen. France, Milan's former ally in their war against Naples, now has a new king with a new goal, the submission of Milan. Leonardo is about to lose his patron, his security, and everything he has struggled for. In Milan, Leonardo da Vinci has created some of his most important work. He spent 17 years in the court of the Duke Ludovico Sforza, realizing his own dreams of success. As Leonardo nears the age of 50, the political winds change. Sforza's former ally, France, abruptly invades Milan. Da Vinci at once loses his patron and his security. His notes reflect his reversal of fortune. The Duke has lost his state, his property, and his freedom. None of our great enterprises will come to pass. The occupying French army, bent on annihilating any sign of the Sforzas, used Da Vinci's epic sculpture for target practice. symbolic act. It shows how closely these equestrian monuments were identified with the power of a certain ruler. Then secondary, it was a great work of art, but first of all it was a symbol. Da Vinci learns in this cruel act how fleeting his success might be, and how vulnerable he is to the fickle nature of politics. Saddened by the loss of the great horse, an aging Leonardo leaves Milan with his faithful apprentice, Salai. All his work must be left behind, the shattered horse, the last supper, all abandoned. With the fall of the house of Sforza in Milan, Leonardo was out of a job and there began a period of his life where he wandered about. His notebooks reflect his state of mind. Patience protects against misfortune as warm clothes protect against the cold. 
The warmer you dress, the more powerless the storm. In the same way, increasing your patience in the face of great wrongs renders them powerless against your peace of mind. His travels take him to Venice, now threatened by the growing power of the Ottoman Turks. Perhaps here he will find a market for his innovative weapons and fortifications. One of the interesting things I think about Leonardo is considering how much of his career he spent not working as an artist. Um, if he, you know, he's always thought about first and foremost as a painter, um, but if you look at the number of years he was employed by various, by various patrons, um, a big chunk of it was spent largely as a military engineer and as an entertainer. He approaches the Duke of Venice with a variety of ideas, even a diving suit and snorkel system for underwater warfare. In his writings, da Vinci describes his complex design. A breastplate of armor with hood, doublet and hose, and the wineskin to hold the breath, with half a hoop of iron to keep it clear of the chest. When you deflate the wineskin, you will go to the bottom, pulled down by sacks of sand. When you inflate it, you will rise to the surface. He seems sometimes almost not to really belong to his age in a day when you know, they didn't even have mundane things like regular ways of keeping time. Um, you know, Leonardo's thinking about walking on the bottom of the ocean and flying in the air with the birds uh, and developing the self-propelled vehicles. He just has such a, such a completely singular vision of pretty much everything around him. Da Vinci's ideas are centuries ahead of his time. His code has led him to dream the impossible. But Venice has no interest in his inventions. He is considered a foreigner, and his visionary ideas create only suspicion. Rejected, he must pursue his dreams elsewhere. He travels back to Florence, the land of his boyhood. It had long since come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely sit back and let things happen to them. They go out and make things happen. But Da Vinci's confidence will soon be challenged. The Florence of his youth has changed. Though he is still recognized as a great artist, someone newer and younger has captured the city's imagination. His name is Michelangelo Buonarroti. A brash young artist of only 26 whose talent is astonishing. Leonardo despises him. Artists of the Renaissance were extremely competitive with each other and with themselves. Tough, disheveled and arrogant, Michelangelo defies Leonardo's expectations of the courtly artist. In his notes, Da Vinci voices his disgust. The sculptor's face is covered with paste and all powdered with marble dust so that he resembles a baker. His house is dirty and filled with chips and dust of stone. With the painter, it is just the opposite. Well dressed, sitting easily in front of his work and moving a very light brush. His home is filled with music unspoiled by the pounding of hammers. The simmering hostility between Leonardo and Michelangelo quickly becomes public. One day as Michelangelo approaches on a busy street, Leonardo defers a question about the writer Dante to the passing sculptor. Michelangelo, lui ha letto Dante. Spiegatelo da solo, e già che ci sei, spiega come imbrogliato la gente di Milano con il tuo impossibile cavallo. Stung by the insult, reminded of his failure, Da Vinci is bitter. He continues to mock Michelangelo's work. I think I'm quoting him accurately when he criticized uh, painters like Michelangelo, for, whose anatomy, he said, made people look as if they were bags full of walnuts. Almost 25 years older than Michelangelo, Leonardo is dispirited, packing up his paints each night with less passion than the night before. 
His writings reflect his growing despair and increasing age. Oh, time, devourer of all things. Oh, spiteful age, how you destroy and consume everything with the relentless teeth of years, little by little in a slow death. Dejected, Leonardo finds opportunity in one of the most unlikely of patrons, a man whose treachery surpasses all others, even in this violent time. His name is Cesare Borgia, and he is bent on carving a bloody path to power straight through the heart of Italy. Having lost the work of 17 years, a disheartened Leonardo da Vinci eventually returns to Florence, only to find himself challenged by a much younger rival, the great artist Michelangelo. His notebooks reveal that even in the face of all this, his code demands that he push on. Obstacles cannot crush me. Every obstacle must yield to stern resolve. He whose gaze is fixed on a distant star will not falter. In 1502, Da Vinci finds an unlikely opportunity in Pope Alexander and his bastard son, one of the most dreaded tyrants of the age, Cesare Borgia. Cesare is accused at least of murdering one or two of his sister's husbands and lovers and maybe his own brother. Cesare himself has, is portrayed by uh, some as being the devil incarnate, by others as being this great, great leader. Borgia personifies the corruption and hunger for power that has come to define the papacy. He is ruthless in his attempt to consolidate his father's empire, hoping to one day claim it as his own. One by one, the cities of Romagna and northern Italy fall to Borgia's papal army. Hungrily, he sets his mark on an ever-widening area. But in order to succeed, he needs an edge, someone with new ideas. He turns to Leonardo da Vinci. Ecco le vostre carte. È un onore servirla. He was given the title of Chief General Engineer by Borgia, and so Leonardo probably had a chance to observe the real horrors of war firsthand. The villages of northern Italy become Borgia's slaughterhouse as his mercenary armies move to expand the holdings of his father, the Pope. Borgia has been described as one of the coolest men in Italian history, and in fact Borgia was the subject of Machiavelli's book, The Prince, as the model warlord who could achieve this unification of Italy. The death of the innocent means nothing to Borgia as he seizes whatever he desires. He makes a reputation as a man of extraordinary cruelty, pragmatic, intelligent, and deadly. Da Vinci serves his patron well, supervising the building of defensive works, towers, trenches, and weaponry. He is finally given the opportunity to pursue military designs, to practice the art of war. For Borgia, Leonardo's greatest skill lay in his unique bird's eye view map, a key to success in battle. By handing these maps to Borgia, Leonardo was enabling this warlord to run his troops through the night and arrive ahead of time at the battle and have a chance to win. And so the relationship between Leonardo and warfare is very complex. Da Vinci and the ruthless Borgia work well together each with a complex mind, each actively ambitious. In the mechanics of war and the subtleties of power, Leonardo excels. This may be one of the things that Leonardo is never given credit for. He seems to know the political winds and he seems to, to blow quite nicely with them. And he fits in very well with uh, Cesare's court. Although Borgia's savagery is well known to Da Vinci, the violence suddenly becomes more personal when Borgia orders the brutal execution of three captains. One, Vitellozzo Vitelli, is a friend of Da Vinci's. 
the artist is repelled. His writings reflect his growing doubts. Truly man is more savage than beast, for our brutality exceeds theirs. We live by the death of others. He finally decides that even animals, they kill for a reason. Human beings, they're just, it becomes part of their nature, just to kill. Da Vinci leaves the service of Borgia and returns to Florence and the art of painting, perhaps to explore the gentler side of human nature. There he begins the one work for which he will always be remembered. No, no, non ridete. Sorridete. È divertente, ma non isterico. Pensate cose dolci. Pensate al vostro amante. Giusto. It is called the Mona Lisa. No one knows who she is, or if she even existed at all. As he paints, Da Vinci keeps her amused with music and entertainment. Leonardo says in his writings that faces are most beautiful at dusk. He captures this effect by using transparent films of paint, a technique which is later called sfumato, which means kind of literally smoking, kind of a smoky effect. You can see it in these almost invisible transitions from light to shade, which are so enigmatic and so incredible that anybody could paint that with brushes. It's really a great display of virtuosity. People often talk about the Mona Lisa smile as being mysterious. If it is mysterious, it's because Leonardo da Vinci has uh, shaded the corners of her mouth and eyes, which are some of the most expressive features of the human face. It's to suggest that the Mona Lisa is a painting of a mystery. That there's something very, very secret going on with the Mona Lisa. And this is, we get the elaboration of this myth of secrecy about the Mona Lisa smile. Or who is the Mona Lisa? You know, is she Leonardo's lover? Is she Leonardo himself? History does not reveal her true identity. Da Vinci's biographer Vasari identifies her as Mona Lisa Giaconda, the wife of a merchant. But Vasari never saw the painting, and Da Vinci himself never left any clue. Carried it around with him for years, and he kept working on it. Never quite done. The only reason it exists in the form it exists today is because he died. The Mona Lisa remains forever a work in progress, a physical manifestation of his code, of his commitment to achieve the impossible. Perfection in painting. Never satisfied, Leonardo's restless mind continues to ponder the world around him. One of his greatest obsessions is the mystery of flight. I mean, in a, in a day when there is no stop motion photography, he was able to look at birds in flight and actually see that birds don't just flap their wings up and down. It's a very complicated sort of figure eight motion of the bird's wing tilting and coming up and turning and pushing down with every single beat. He uses his knowledge of engineering to design machines that he hopes will be capable of flight. And he makes a bold prediction. There shall be wings for man. If it is not accomplished by me, then it will be some day by some other. He adapts a child's spinning toy into a design for a hovering apparatus, using a helical screw rather than a rotor as modern helicopters do. He creates bat-winged flying machines whose wings would flap like a bird with an elaborate framework, one that even includes a rudder-like flight control. There is a legend that he tried to actually fly a machine and that the machine crashed and someone broke a leg in this attempt. Leonardo's machines are amazing and fantastic um, in, in the way that fantastic is fantasy. Maybe they didn't work, but they 
mean so much as far as the mind is concerned, as far as his actual ability to think beyond the box. But he seems to have, have realized that the amount of power necessary to make one of his you know, six foot long wings flap was more than a person could provide. Uh, so then he starts getting into more complicated designs that actually involve um, motors of some sort that will actually store up enough energy so that you can get them to flap for a while before the motor stops. Only late in life does he consider the idea of a single fixed wing, the idea that will eventually lead to successful flight hundreds of years later. For all his striving, for all his extraordinary designs, he never succeeds in solving the great challenge of manned flight. But for almost his entire life, he keeps trying. He's a brilliant man. He's a brilliant engineer as far as the theory is concerned. But maybe the practice, maybe the practical part of things, uh, the practical part of engineering, which so often eludes these great thinkers, also eluded him. Despite Leonardo's frustrations with engineering, it is with a far more complex machine that he achieves his most remarkable success. His grim obsession with the moment of death leads him to master the workings of the human body itself. Leonardo da Vinci, now 53, has been working on the most recognized and celebrated masterpiece of all time, the Mona Lisa. He will keep working on it and keep it with him until the day he dies. His obsession with both artistic perfection and technical precision leads da Vinci in a surprising direction. he turns his insatiable curiosity to the study of life's greatest work of art, the human body. He was interested in anatomy from an early age, probably from his time in Verrocchio's workshop, where artists in Florence were encouraged either to perform dissections, autopsies at a medical school, for example, or they were encouraged, if not to perform them, then at least to observe them. Always fascinated with the human body, he studies the mysteries of death at the hospitals of Santa Maria Novella. Dicono che abbiate vissuto cento anni. È vero? Cento anni? Non è così difficile. Non sento dolori. Solo stanco. Tanto stanco. E terribilmente debole. He's interested in the way that the pieces of the human body, which is, after all, a very intricate mechanism, the way the pieces of this mechanism fit together. Within hours of the old man's death, Da Vinci descends into the cavernous morgue to dismantle nature's ultimate machine. We might be surprised that Leonardo's uh, dissection of human corpses wasn't frowned on by the the church of his time. That seems, though, to be more of a modern concept and modern prescription. Here, he will make an astonishing discovery, centuries ahead of its time. I conducted an autopsy in order to determine the cause of such a peaceful death and found that it was caused by the failure of blood flowing into the artery that feeds the heart and other lower members, which I found withered and shrunk. In 1507, Leonardo makes history's first description of arteriosclerosis by comparing the circulatory system of the elderly man with that of a child's. And we have to try to imagine 500 years ago what it would have been like to work on an autopsy without the benefit of good lighting or good uh, preservation of the material. The smell must have been awful. Under challenging conditions, Leonardo invents an entirely new way of seeing. Later, his cross-sections and exploded diagrams will profoundly influence the modern method of visualizing anatomy and machinery. His code, like the man himself, becomes mature. 
experimentation continues to be the primary engine in his effort to achieve what no one else could. I am inspired by the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must act on it. Being willing is not enough. We must do. His famous notebooks reveal the extreme scope of his visionary ideas. And yet he never publishes a page of them. Often in his notes you'll see him uh, talking about, I'm gonna, you know, do a book on this subject that will lay out this, 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 and this. There was always, you know, a little bit more you could do. There was one more observation you could make. And, you know, time caught up with him. As Leonardo ages, his legacy becomes a casual bundle of documents, a lifetime of genius written onto thousands of bits of fragile paper, including the only image we have of the man himself. There is one image of an old man that's commonly attributed as being a self-portrait, but we don't know. It's completely untitled. It's just a, a sketch among, you know, millions of other sketches that he did. What I think is interesting is the extent to which that Leonardo is completely lost to us. Toward the end of his life in 1517, King Francis I of France, a great admirer and collector of his work, invites da Vinci and his two assistants, Salai and Francesco Melzi, to live on his royal chateau in Clos. Leonardo got his last job, which is essentially being court genius to the King of France. He didn't really have much in the way of responsibilities. The King of France just wanted him as an ornament. The King names Leonardo da Vinci favorite painter, engineer, and architect. But at 65, Leonardo's triumphs are behind him. A stroke has paralyzed his right arm and his left hand can no longer paint fine details. He doesn't seem to have had any obligations. Leonardo doesn't seem to have done much in those last few years, except for enjoy life. And uh, he did enjoy life. It was the high part of a, a very well-deserved retirement, I suppose. Salai, the boy taken on so many years ago, has stayed with Da Vinci. And Melzi has become his student and most trusted companion. So Leonardo, at the time, he has with him uh, the Mona Lisa, a couple of other paintings, all of which he, he um, bequeaths to Melzi, who is his apprentice and had been traveling with him for years and years. In 1519, after months of failing health, Leonardo da Vinci passes into history. I think Leonardo is one of these individuals who had a code of, of success. He didn't measure it in degrees of wealth. He didn't measure it in degrees of popularity. He measured it in how he felt about his own achievements. To me, Leonardo da Vinci represents something about human beings themselves. He represents uh, someone who overcame a number of social obstacles and really does show what we're capable of. His ability to see so far beyond his present day reality is I think one of the things that makes him eternally popular. We have a body of writing. We have a trail of documents. But Leonardo, it's a complicated mosaic. Painting was a source of knowledge. To Leonardo da Vinci, painting was a science. He can inspire all of us today, regardless of who we are, to try to make the most of our lives as we can. Da Vinci's genius catapulted him out of obscurity and into the courts of kings. By refusing to compromise his own intellectual code or be crushed by adversity, he becomes the most important man of his age. He becomes immortal.